Book Five, Section Ten of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Section Ten. I have still to speak of monarchy and the causes of its destruction and preservation. What I have said already, respecting forms of constitutional government, applies almost equally to royal and to tyrannical rule. For royal rule is of the nature of an aristocracy, and a tyranny is a compound of oligarchy and democracy in their most extreme forms. It is, therefore, most injurious to its subjects, being made up of two evil forms of government, and having the perversions and errors of both. These two forms of monarchy are contrary in their very origin. The appointment of a king is the resource of the better classes against the people, and he is elected by them out of their own number, because either he himself or his family excel in virtue and virtuous actions, whereas a tyrant is chosen from the people to be their protector against the notables, and in order to prevent them from being injured. History shows that almost all tyrants have been demagogues who gain the favor of the people by their accusation of the notables. At any rate, this was the manner in which the tyrannies arose in the days when cities had increased in power. Others, which were older, originated in the ambition of kings, wanting to overstep the limits of their hereditary power and become despots. Others, again, grew out of the class which were chosen to be chief magistrates, for in ancient times, the people who elected them gave the magistrates, whether civil or religious, a long tenure. Others arose out of the custom which oligarchies had, of making some individual supreme over the highest offices. In any of these ways, an ambitious man had no difficulty, if he desired, in creating a tyranny, since he had the power in his hands already, either as king or as one of the officers of state. Thus Phidon and Argos and several others were originally kings, and ended by becoming tyrants. Phalaris, on the other hand, and the Ionian tyrants, acquired the tyranny by holding great offices. Whereas Panetius at Leontini, Sipsilus at Corinth, Pisistratus at Athens, Dionysius at Syracuse, and several others who afterwards became tyrants, were at first demagogues. And so, as I was saying, Royalty ranks with aristocracy, for it is based upon merit, whether of the individual or of his family, or on benefits conferred, or on these claims with power added to them. For all who have obtained this honor have benefited, or had in their power to benefit, states and nations. Some, like Codrus, have prevented the state from being enslaved in war. Others, like Cyrus, have given their country freedom or have settled or gained a territory like the Lacedaemonian, Macedonian, and Molossian kings. The idea of a king is to be a protector of the rich against unjust treatment, of the people against insult and oppression, whereas a tyrant, as has often been repeated, has no regard to any public interest, except as conducive to his private ends. His aim is pleasure, the aim of a king, honor. Wherefore also in their desires they differ, the tyrant is desirous of riches, the king of what brings honor, and the guards of a king are citizens, but of a tyrant, mercenaries. That tyranny has all the vices both of democracy and oligarchy is evident. As of oligarchy, so of tyranny, the end is wealth, for by wealth only can the tyrant maintain either his guard or his luxury. Both mistrust the people, and therefore deprive them of their arms. Both agree, too, in injuring the people, and driving them out of the city and dispersing them. From democracy, tyrants have borrowed the art of making war upon the notables, and destroying them secretly or openly, or of exiling them because they are rivals, and stand in the way of their power, and also because plots against them are contrived by men of this das, who either want to rule or to escape subjection. Hence Periander advised Thrasybulus, by cutting off the tops of the tallest ears of corn, meaning that he must always put out of the way the citizens who overtop the rest. And so, as I have already intimated, the beginnings of change are the same in monarchies as in forms of constitutional government, 
subjects attack their sovereigns out of fear or contempt, or because they have been unjustly treated by them. And of injustice, the most common form is insult. Another is confiscation of property. The ends sought by conspiracies against monarchies, whether tyrannies or royalties, are the same as the ends sought by conspiracies against other forms of government. Monarchs have great wealth and honor, which are objects of desire to all mankind. The attacks are made sometimes against their lives, sometimes against the office, where the sense of insult is the motive against their lives. Any sort of insult, and there are many, may stir up anger, and when men are angry, they commonly act out of revenge and not from ambition. For example, the attempt made upon the Posistratidae arose out of the public dishonor offered to the sister of Harmodius, and the insult to himself. He attacked the tyrant for his sister's sake, and Aristogiton joined in the attack for the sake of Harmodius. A conspiracy was also formed against Periander, the tyrant of Ambracia, because, when drinking with a favored youth, he asked him whether by this time he was not with child by him. Philip, too, was attacked by Pausanias, because he permitted him to be insulted by Attalus and his friends, and Amentus the Little by Dirtus, because he boasted of having enjoyed his youth. Evagoras of Cyprus, again, was slain by the eunuch to revenge an insult, for his wife had been carried off by Evagoras's son. Many conspiracies have originated in shameful attempts made by sovereigns on the persons of their subjects. Such was the attack of Critias upon Archelaus. He had always hated the connection with him, and so when Archelaus, having promised him one of his two daughters in marriage, did not give him either of them, but broke his word and married the elder to the king of Alamea, when he was hard-pressed in a war against Cyrus and Arabius, and the younger to his own son Amentus, under the idea that Amentus would then be less likely to quarrel with his son by Cleopatra, Critias made this slight a pretext for attacking Archelaus, though even a less reason would have sufficed, for the real cause of the estrangement was the disgust which he felt at his connection with the king. And from a like motive, Hellenocrates of Larissa conspired with him, for when Archelaus, who was his lover, did not fulfill his promise of restoring him to his country, he thought that the connection between them had originated not in affection, but in the wantonness of power. Pytho too and Heraclides of Enos slew Cottus in order to avenge their father, and Adamus revolted from Cottus in revenge for the wanton outrage which he had committed in mutilating him when a child. Many, too, irritated at blows inflicted on the person which they deemed an insult, have either killed or attempted to kill officers of state and royal princes by whom they have been injured. Thus at Mytilene, Megacles and his friends attacked and slew the Penthilidae, as they were going about and striking people with clubs. At a later date, Smyrtus, who had been beaten and torn away from his wife by Penthilus, slew him. In the conspiracy against Archelaus, Decamnicus stimulated the fury of the assassins and led the attack. He was enraged because Archelaus had delivered him to Euripides to be scourged, for the poet had been irritated at some remark made by Decamnicus on the foulness of his breath. Many other examples might be cited of murders and conspiracies which have arisen from similar causes. Fear is another motive which, as we have said, has caused conspiracies as well in monarchies as in more popular forms of government. Thus Artapanes conspired against Xerxes and slew him, fearing that he would be accused of hanging Darius against his orders, he having been under the impression that Xerxes would forget what he had said in the middle of a meal, and that the offense would be forgiven. Another motive is contempt, as in the case of Sardanapalus, whom someone saw carting wool with his women, if the storytellers say truly, and the tale may be true, if not of him, of someone else. Dion attacked the younger Dionysius because he despised him, and saw that he was equally despised by his own subjects, and that he was always drunk. Even the friends of a tyrant will sometimes attack him out of contempt, for the confidence which he reposes in them breeds contempt, and they think that they will not be found out. The expectation of success is likewise a sort of contempt. The assailants are ready to strike, and think nothing of the danger, because they seem to have the power in their hands. Thus generals of armies attack monarchs, as, for example, Cyrus attacked Astyages, 
despising the effeminacy of his life, and believing that his power was worn out. Thus again Seuthes the Thracian conspired against Amaticus, whose general he was. And sometimes men are actuated by more than one motive, like Mithridates, who conspired against Ariobarzanes, partly out of contempt and partly from the love of gain. Bold natures, placed by their sovereigns in a high military position, are most likely to make the attempt in the expectation of success, for courage is emboldened by power, and the union of the two inspires them with the hope of an easy victory. Attempts of which the motive is ambition arise in a different way as well as in those already mentioned. There are men who will not risk their lives in the hope of gains and honors, however great, but who nevertheless regard the killing of a tyrant simply as an extraordinary action which will make them famous and honorable in the world. They wish to acquire not a kingdom, but a name. It is rare, however, to find such men. He who would kill a tyrant must be prepared to lose his life if he fail. He must have the resolution of Dion, who, when he made war upon Dionysius, took with him very few troops, saying, that whatever measure of success he might attain would be enough for him, even if he were to die the moment he landed. Such a death would be welcome to him. This is a temper to which few can attain. Once more, tyrannies, like all other governments, are destroyed from without by some opposite and more powerful form of government. That such a government will have the will to attack them is clear, for the two are opposed in principle and all men, if they can, do what they will. Democracy is antagonistic to tyranny, on the principle of Hesiod, Potter hates Potter, because they are nearly akin. For the extreme form of democracy is tyranny, and royalty and aristocracy are both alike opposed to tyranny, because they are constitutions of a different type. And therefore the Lacedaemonians put down most of the tyrannies, and so did the Syracusans during the time when they were well governed. Again, tyrannies are destroyed from within, when the reigning family are divided among themselves, as that of Gelo was, and more recently that of Dionysius. In the case of Gelo, because Thrasybulus, the brother of Hiero, flattered the son of Gelo, and led him into excesses in order that he might rule in his name. Whereupon the family got together a party to get rid of Thrasybulus, and save the tyranny but those of the people who conspired with them seized the opportunity and drove them all out. In the case of Dionysius, Dion, his own relative, attacked and expelled him with the assistance of the people. He afterwards perished himself. There are two chief motives which induce men to attack tyrannies, hatred and contempt. Hatred of tyrants is inevitable, and contempt is also a frequent cause of their destruction. Thus we see that most of those who have acquired have retained their power, but those who have inherited have lost it almost at once, for, living in luxurious ease, they have become contemptible, and offer many opportunities to their assailants. Anger, too, must be included under hatred, and produces the same effects. It is oftentimes even more ready to strike. The angry are more impetuous in making an attack, for they do not follow rational principle. And men are very apt to give way to their passions when they are insulted. To this cause is to be attributed the fall of the Pusistrotity, and of many others. Hatred is more reasonable, for anger is accompanied by pain, which is an impediment to reason, whereas hatred is painless. In a word, all the causes which I have mentioned as destroying the last and most unmixed form of oligarchy, and the extreme form of democracy, may be assumed to affect tyranny. Indeed, the extreme forms of both are only tyrannies distributed among several persons. Kingly rule is little affected by external causes, and is therefore lasting. It is generally destroyed from within. And there are two ways in which destruction may come about. One, when the members of the royal family quarrel among themselves, and two, when the kings attempt to administer the state too much after the fashion of a tyranny, and to extend their authority contrary to the law. Royalties do not now come into existence, where such forms of government arise, they are rather monarchies or tyrannies. For the rule of a king is over voluntary subjects, 
and he is supreme in all important matters. But in our own day, men are more upon an equality, and no one is so immeasurably superior to others as to represent adequately the greatness and dignity of the office. Hence mankind will not, if they can help, endure it, and any one who obtains power by force or fraud is at once thought to be a tyrant. In hereditary monarchies, a further cause of destruction is the fact that kings often fall into contempt, and although possessing not tyrannical powers, but only royal dignity, are apt to outrage others. Their overthrow is then readily effected, for there is an end to the king when his subjects do not want to have him, but the tyrant lasts, whether they like him or not. The destruction of monarchies is to be attributed to these and the like causes. End of Book 5, Section 10